Hey, what is up guys? I'm KPHD here and welcome back to Dope Tech. I'm bringing it back. So previous episodes were all thematic where they would be based around a group of things with one theme or maybe just one huge piece of dope tech. But there's been so many things that have come out in the past year and that are about to come out that are all dope tech but don't necessarily get their own video. So this is my way of sort of collecting them in one place. I know some other people have their sort of favorite tech of the month or of the season or quarter or whatever you wanna call it. This is my version of that. This is Dope Tech. It's a video series to showcase the most impressive, bleeding edge, super high end, or just straight up awesome tech that makes its way to the studio that doesn't necessarily get its own video. It will all be here. So this may feel a little rapid fire, but that's what happens this time of year when there's so much impressive stuff coming out. So let's get right into it. So I'm gonna start with this guy. So this is called the Asus ZenBook Pro Duo. It's pretty wild. I'd describe it as a sort of almost dual screen laptop. Uh, you can probably already see what I mean. So it's already a big desktop replacement, high-end laptop. It has a 15 inch 4K OLED display, which Right off the bat, there's not a whole lot of laptops like that. It has an Intel 9th Gen 8 core CPU, RTX 2060 graphics, a terabyte SSD, 32 gigs of RAM, and a ton of high-speed I.O. As you can see, no card reader, but both full-size USB and USB Type-C. But the high-end specs aren't why this is dope tech. It's, of course, this crazy form factor. So first of all, you can see this hinge is pretty unique. I like unique hinges. This one unfolds the laptop into a sort of a propping it up off of whatever surface you're on. And that serves several functions. One, it gives you a better typing angle and it's gonna need that extra cooling for this massive second screen it has on the bottom half. It's like the MacBook Pro's touch bar went and ate five or six other touch bars and then went to the gym and just got super huge. Uh, it's gigantic to the point where it is another 4K IPS display itself. Uh, it's not full UHD, but it is 3840 across by 1100 tall. And it's coated in this anti-glare finish, so it's matte like Apple's touch bar to avoid glare from overhead lights and things like that, which makes sense since it's at this angle, but it also appears a bit dimmer than the main display since you're never really looking directly at it. It's always at this sort of off sideways viewing angle. And it's also super smooth and soft to the touch. It is a touch screen, um, unlike the glossier top display, which is really nice to touch. Anyway, okay, so what is the second screen for? What does it do? So essentially the best thing it does is act as a second display. So Windows actually sees it as two different displays, but you can do the same thing on both screens if you want, which is, kind of trippy, but the best stuff you'll do with it will come with window management. So you can get one Chrome window up at the top while you have Spotify open on the bottom and maybe a Twitter window on the other side and all the window snapping and everything that Windows does will work the same. You can snap left or snap right, go full screen, and there's an extra layer of ASUS software added to let you do things like switch apps between the screens or pin the launcher or full screen apps across both displays. Full screening across both displays, like I said, it's kind of weird looking, but it does work. I just think this is the least often way that you'll use it unless some apps happen to scale perfectly. Maybe you can imagine having Adobe's Lightroom up at the top with most of the UI elements where they normally are, but just the film strip of all your photos at the bottom. Or maybe Adobe Premiere up at the top, but just the timeline on the bottom screen. The way I find myself using it most often was just using the regular apps and stuff like I normally do at the top and then having something like Spotify or maybe Twitter or something like a files app that I can just sort of mindlessly keep there but I'm not using on the main screen. Then I sort of have my setup going and I don't know, it's kind of great. And then Asus has a couple other features built in to make this layout more useful, like a dock that you can pin apps to, and you can have it remember app layouts with multiple apps, so you can just hit one button and it loads your whole layouts for all your apps again. I'm into it, I think it could be worth it. Now the question for someone considering buying this laptop right now is, is it worth moving the keyboard all the way down to the bottom edge and crunching the trackpad from this widescreen laptop all the way over the corner in this little postage stamp size. I don't know, I guess most of the time you're using something like this, you'll have a mouse with you. And bonus, the heating vents or cooling vents on the side will actually heat your hand with the mouse. Fun fact. But I, I just figure people will find like the perfect use case for something like this to work out 
in their workflow. Like a gamer playing a game up at the top and having their Twitch stream live chat and Discord on the bottom screen. Just certain things are gonna work perfectly with this top and bottom screen setup that are gonna make it worth the compromise of that tiny trackpad. Laptops of the future might be similar to this, or they might get rid of the keyboard entirely for some people. It'll just be one giant screen with a folding display in the middle that just folds shut like a clamshell. We're not there yet, and they call this a laptop of the future, and I, I think for a lot of people it is, but if you wanna get this right now, you can. It starts at less than 3,000 bucks, so I'll have a link to everything I talk about in this video in the description. Okay, next up is another dual screen thing, kinda. Uh, it's the LG V50 and it's dual screen case. Now the phone by itself wouldn't have made dope tech. Gonna be perfectly honest, it's a, a pretty under the radar phone, but it has 5G now and it still does have that quad DAC and the headphone jack, but otherwise a pretty standard issue smartphone for a thousand bucks. But what they do have is a fascinating implementation for doubling your pixels on a smartphone. And you guys know I'm a kind of a sucker for pixels. So I guess they basically said, screw it. Since we can't make a folding phone right now, what we can do is put some pins on the back of an existing phone and then make a case that takes those pins and has a display in it and turns it into a dual screen phone. So you pop it into this case, you hit the dual screen button, and now you have a dual screen phone. Now, still, I don't know how much I'd use something like this. It's no doubt drawing extra power from the phone. It'll make your battery life a bit less, but honestly, the way it works, it, it works surprisingly well. Like it's much smoother than I expected. So you can go ahead and open different things on each screen, and then the dual screen feature lets you swap what's on each screen, put one of the screens to sleep, etc. They've really thought this through. It's not as automatic as an actual folding phone, but that's of course not really what this is. You can even go sideways with it. You can watch a full screen video on one screen while you text or tweet or do whatever you want on the other. Kind of looks like a Nintendo DS when it's sideways like this. It's an interesting concept. And then it folds over completely backwards if you want it to, which deactivates the back screen. So now if you just want to use the phone normally and leave it in this case, you can do that. Um, folding phones, I guess, can't really do that, but I, I just love how much they've thought this through. And it does one thing I think better than any folding phone does in my opinion, which is just like that. The springs, the, the weight of that build quality. It's built well. I don't know, I just think this is just so interestingly well considered. The, the cutout up here for the earpiece to pass through if you make a phone call with it. The fact that you can flip it over completely. It's funny, it brings me back to, you know what it brings me back to? When HTC made that dot matrix case for the HTC One M8 back in the day. That was one of the, I think that is actually the first video I ever shot on a RED camera. Fun fact. Okay, so next up are these guys right here. So these are Sony's new wireless noise canceling earbuds. They're called the WF-1000XM3. The name is still terrible, but they are absolutely worth your consideration. I think they're my new favorite wireless earbuds right now. So with these new totally wireless earbuds, there's a couple different types of earbuds wearers that I think I've sort of picked up on. One would be the Powerbeats Pro type of user where you're getting them specifically to work out, to sweat in them, run around, shake your head a lot, that type of thing. And the other is like the AirPods type of user where you're just having the convenience of no wires, taking some phone calls, listening to music, pretty chill. And these fall somewhere in between. I reviewed Sony's over-ear headphones not too long ago and they turned into my favorite headphones to fly with, period. So now that I've experienced those, I wouldn't necessarily buy these to fly with, but they do an impressive job at a lot of things for earbuds. So first of all, they're comfortable, which is like priority number one for me for earbuds when they sit in your ear, is that they're comfortable. And these are, and they just sit in your ear just like this. They have touch controls over physical buttons, which takes a little bit of getting used to, but I actually prefer that on earbuds so you don't have to be pressing them into your ear just to press one of the buttons. Um, and there's a lot of stuff you can do with it in the Sony app, like remapping controls from the right earbud to the left earbud, they're very customizable. And they have auto play pause, so when you take it out of your ear, whatever music's playing stops. And I love that a lot of these are doing them now with the proximity sensor in the earbud, and it's quick. It stops pretty much as soon as you take it out and plays as soon as you put it back in. And uh, they also have multiple device connectivity 
which is funny because the headphone versions of these that I reviewed not that long ago didn't have that. These do. And overall, I'm gonna say that they are the best sounding wireless earbuds that I've heard, that I've tried so far. They're on par with, or better than the Jaybird runs. Great mids, not really shrill highs, and pretty solid bass. And again, in the Sony app, you can change the frequency response if you like it to be bassier. The noise cancellation element is kinda minor, just because you're getting most of your noise isolation from the passive seal created by the earbuds anyway but they do a little extra work with the microphones to quiet those constant background noises. So if you're in a car or in a train or a plane or something like that, these are nice. The case to these isn't too bad, you know, somewhere between AirPods and Powerbeats, pocketable, but just barely, but it quick charges the buds, which is nice, and it's matte black, so I guess I have to like it. <laughs> and it does instant pairing with this NFC just by touching it to the back of your phone. That's tight. The one downside, the big downside really, is that these are not water resistant. So if you wanna work out in these, you'd still wanna get something like the Power Beats so you can actually sweat in them and they'd stay in your ears better. But other than that, not a whole lot of bad things to say about them. We're also expecting possibly noise canceling AirPods to be a thing pretty soon actually. We may see that by the end of 2019. So if you're waiting and sort of holding your breath for better AirPods, that might be interesting to you. But if you're not one of those people, these are definitely a pair that you should check out. They're 100% worth your consideration. Okay, Sony RX100 Mark Seven. I just wanted to bring this up for one specific reason. So there are a lot of really great in-depth videos on the new RX100s on YouTube. I'll link those below. This obviously isn't that, but I've been an RX100 fan since literally the very first one. It's been an awesome compact photo camera, and then it stepped up its game as a 4K video camera over the past couple of years, articulating LCD screen, better color science, eye tracking autofocus. And it's always been such a great compact form factor and it's felt very modular. It's got a pop-up OLED EVF. It has a pop-up flash. It has a custom ring that you can map to whatever you want. But it's always been missing one thing, a mic jack. And this version, Mark 7, finally has a mic jack. Honestly, it seems like every time Canon releases something, Sony is always ready with something right up their sleeve, like waiting to be released. It seems like this is another one of those things that sort of came in the middle of a cycle. They had done it on the year pretty regularly for a while until this one, but they finally threw a mic jack in the RX100 Mark VII, which I think makes it that much better of a little point and shoot vlogging camera. Definitely worth checking out. The competition back and forth between Canon and Sony over the years has actually been really fascinating to watch. It almost seems like Canon enjoys shooting themselves in the foot and leaving out individual features that would make a camera amazing. Sony does not have a habit of doing that at this point. All right, I don't know if you saw it over here before, but it was in a previous shot. This is the newest member of the Logitech MX family. It's the Logitech MX Master 3. So it just came out, but Logitech has let me use this guy for the past week, and I gotta say, I like it a lot. In appearance, it is a pretty minor update from the MX Master 2S. It looks pretty similar but it has some minor adjustments. The battery indicator, for example, is higher up, so you can see it even when your hand is on the mouse. The forward and back buttons are a bit more separate, so they're easier to press without looking. And the sort of a hex design is now these more clear ridges and it's clean, and a couple other really subtle things. The main difference is the scroll wheel is now much improved, and the software is super customizable. So now you can map the same buttons for different functions in different apps. So for example, the sideways scroll wheel for me, in Final Cut, that will scroll left and right on the timeline, but in Photoshop, it'll change the brush size, and in the browser, it'll just scroll left and right. And of course, the one main thing that I was sort of hoping that they would do all along, actually with the last MX Master, is they've switched over to USB Type-C. And for no other reason than the fact that I can use a bunch of my existing cables now, that's really satisfying. So I've really enjoyed using this, editing with this mouse, using it every day. It's one of the few pieces of tech that I can say I've consistently had the same product or version of the product in my workflow for a very long time. So the best mouse that I've used for the past couple years just got better. Gotta love that. Continuity. All right, so last but not least is the microphone that I'm speaking into right now. 
this. It's not even new. It's just new to me, and I newly love it. It's the Shure SM7B. So you've probably heard of this guy already if you're in the podcasting world, but I've been doing video for so long, and I've been using a shotgun microphone specifically by Sennheiser for so long that now that I'm doing podcasts and that I'm in this audio world, I'm discovering this whole new world of audio gear. So this mic, this one specifically might be the most popular one out there. It's the one Joe Rogan uses. It's the one a ton of radio stations have used probably ASMR videos, it's, it's, it's out there. It is made specifically for vocals, both in the way it's tuned for frequency response and what noises it isolates, and in the way it's built. It's solid metal, it's rugged, just about everything about it. One pro tip I can give besides getting it on an arm and getting the microphone as close to your mouth as possible for the best sound is to get some sort of external amplification like this. This is a cloud lifter. If you haven't already heard of it, it's often sold with the Shure SM7B, which happens to be a very quiet microphone by itself if you go straight into a recorder, which is what we tried first on episode one of our podcast. But we found these, we got them, they do a great job of amplifying, and now the microphone sounds much more lively and more open. It just sounds better. So you plug the microphone via XLR into the cloud lifter, you plug the cloud lifter into your recorder, and you get the amplification that way. And it's great. So I just figured I'd give a shout out to the mic, which is a central piece of the podcast, and give a shout out to the podcast while we're at it. But either way, that has been it. That is episode one of Dope Tech. And I'm, I'm super open to your suggestions for both format and all sorts of other ways that we can make these episodes better. I think they're a lot of fun, but I think we're going to have a lot of other stuff to show you. So other ways that we can do it well are welcome in the comment section below. But again, like I said, all the links of all the things I talked about are also below. And that'll be it. Thank you for watching. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace.